I was on a plane coming back from New York to Chicago, and I was reading the Look magazine. There were three big magazines, Look, Life, and the Saturday Evening Post was reading Look. And being a sports person, I was reading a story called I Am Third. It was excerpts from his book by Gail Sayers, the famous player for the Chicago Bears. I didn't realize it, but the stewardess came over and said, are you okay? I said, yeah. She said, well, you're crying. And I was sobbing. And other passengers were looking at me. And I said, no, I'm OK. It's just the story is very touching. I got off the plane. In the airport, I called Barry, who was at ABC running the movie for television. I said, I just read the most amazing piece. We have to do it as a movie for television. He said, well, after the driver drops you off, have him bring it by. It's like 8 o'clock at night. My phone rings early the next morning, very early. Barry said, it's fantastic, let's do it. But that's also the way the business used to be, not that way anymore. Very few people can do that, have the access, have the passion to do that. And we started doing Brian's song. There was a young writer at uh, Screen Gems named William Glenn, who I thought was a fantastic writer, but he had not, you know, he'd written some Here Come the Brides, another one of my failed ABC shows. But I thought he was terrific. And so I gave him the task. Paul Witt, who was an associate producer on several things, who was under contract with Screen Gems, to be the producer. I don't think he had ever produced anything or anything. And Tony Thomas, Marlowe's brother, who was working at Screen Gems for Paul, would be his associate producer, the first thing he would ever be associate producer. The script came in, it was wonderful. Barry immediately approved going to film on it. Burt Reynolds wanted to do it. Burt was a big movie star, and he wanted to do the movie for television. And I remember Paul saying to me, I, I know he's a big movie star, but when he dies, are we going to cry? And I don't think so. Very bold statement for a young man. So we cast uh, Jimmy Kahn, who told me he played football at Michigan State. I thought 150s maybe. But, and um, Lou Gossett. And the week before we were supposed to start shooting, Lou Gossett was practicing football, tore his Achilles tendon. I had to go see him in the hospital and say, Lou, I'm so sorry. We can't wait. You know, we get $375,000 and we're already spending money. We're, we're going to Chicago to be in the Bears camp. And he understood, and then so I went to Billy D. Williams and said, Billy, you know, we're already over budget. We haven't even begun. There's not a lot of money here. He said, I'll do it for nothing, because I know what this is going to do. So we shot Brian Song, and there were so many funny things that happened. I made them go on location to shoot. Our production guy was saying, we're getting $375,000. We're going to the Bears training camp. What difference does it make what lunchroom we shoot in? We can do it here. I said, but it's not the Bears. But Jimmy Kahn, the Bears used to rib the hell out of him. The first time he came on the field, Dick Butkus, the old world linebacker, said to Kahn, he pointed to his legs. And he said to him, the last time I saw legs like that, they had messages taped to them, and so on. But they loved him, and they loved the guys, and it was just a great, great time. The dailies were fantastic, and we go to see the rough cut. And we're sitting there, and the rough cut doesn't work. And I'm sweating. How can this happen? The script was great, the dailies were great, it doesn't work. The lights come on. Nobody speaks because we all felt that it didn't work. Bill Blinn said, 
I think I know what's wrong. Give me two days. Give you two days. Well, how can you shoot in two days? Don't have to shoot. Just give me two days. He and Paul and Tony go off. I think, what the hell are they going to do? Two days later, we go to the screening. They hadn't changed one foot of film. What they had gotten was Bill wrote narration over the beginning of the movie and the end of the movie. Not one sh foot had been changed. And what you hear is Jack Warden's voice. This is a story about two men. One a black man from Chicago, the other a white man from North Carolina. Tells a little about him, and you see the opening of the movie, and uh, Brian Piccolo, Khan, is ridden up to the practice field, and a ball gets loose and rolls over, and he picks up the football as Gail Sayers comes over to him. And the narration says, I hope I don't break up, because I still do. Ernest Hemingway once wrote that all true stories end in death. This is a true story. And he says, hi, I'm Gail Sayers. I mean, even now, we sat there. Same movie, foot for foot. And at the end, he said, Brian Piccolo died of cancer at the age of 26, but when people talk about him, they don't talk about how he died, but how he lived, how he did live. <laughs> Taught me an amazing lesson. How you frame film for an audience is so important. Because not one foot had been changed. Just a voice telling you what you were going to see. Amazing, just amazing. <laughs>